Skinner here from Gen X. On this episode, we talk about Narcan and vending machines, talk about the baseball playoffs, this week in the NFL, Thelma, is she gay? Talk about John Denver and his plane crash, the Renderlands passing, and our favorite SNL skits. Stay tuned. This is an It Came From Gen X video. Hello everyone, welcome to It Came From Gen X. Alongside Brian Fisher, I am Michael Skinner. We are down one today. Uh, Mr. Keith Porterhouse Porter can't be with us this week, and uh, we certainly will miss him, but we will do our best to try to move on, or as they say, the show must go on, right? How you doing today, Fish? Doing well. Thank you, brother, for feeling better. Got over the uh, old COVID again. Uh, yeah, feeling great. Great Good weekend, deal. man. I, I Friday... Went to go see Iron Maiden down in Columbus yes. with How uh, was that? Uh, buddy Jim Cunningham. Great show, man. They sounded great. Uh, same lineup they've had for many, many years. The stage show was fantastic. They all sounded great, played great. Just a fun time. And Columbus is fun in general, so we had some fun kind of <laughs> hanging out around there a little bit too and taking in uh, some of the stuff there for a minute. So, yeah, a lot of fun. And then uh, Keith and I, he started a, a second job, he told us, uh, uh, you know, uh, technical tip lessons for troubled youth. That's what he's doing here. So he's teaching <laughs> yeah. kids how to set up, you know, computer equipment and how to record podcasts and all that good stuff. So hopefully how that's going pretty to well for break him. monitors while grabbing something from behind, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> so how are you? What's new with you? <clears throat> uh, busy weekend. Um, things are well, feeling better. That mm -hmm. uh, sinus infection I had a couple weeks ago just knocked me for a loop, uh, but uh, doing better. We uh, went to a Elvis impersonation show, actually an Elvis show on Saturday night at the Barberton Moose. So we took, um, actually, Mr. Porter went with us with uh, mm -hmm. Marcy and Marcy's mom and grandma. We actually had a really good time. You know, I like Elvis's music. I always have, but I don't understand the act. I really don't. These ladies that were at this show, let me tell you, we had to get the hell out of there before the show ended. Otherwise, you know, who knows what would have happened. But we'll keep it a family show. But I never have understood the act. Um, so, women so people, just, like, they, they act like the impersonator. They they treat him like the actual Elvis, you mean, type of deal? They, yes, he dressed up like Elvis. He sung. He, the guy was fantastic. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. His his voice was powerful. He acted like Elvis. He did the Elvis jokes. He did the, you know, the signature. He had a few of the signature moves. Gave out the, you know, gave out the the lays with the Hawaiian show, and he had the scarves. Then every bought every lady in the in the place got a scarf with his <laughs> little bit of sweat. <laughs> and uh. Keith made a great joke. He goes, you know, there's two things about this: is one, he is not Elvis. And he's giving these these ladies his sweat. And two, what about COVID? A valid point yeah. on both of them. So, but no, it was a great night. The music was fun. Um, got to spend time with Marcy's grandma, which is always a great time. She's getting up there in age. She's 87, 88 years old and still able to, to get out and do some things. So Very nice. it was pretty special for Marcy too. So that yeah, good weekend otherwise. That's good. That's good. So, well, we've got a lot to talk about uh, in Keith's absence with uh, sports and music and, of course, a uh, pretty good topic that uh, I want to discuss with you. So before we do, can you uh, tell everybody where they can find us? Absolutely, brother. So you might be listening to us on demand wherever you're listening to podcasts. So we can be found on many major podcast platform platforms, not platform, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, 
uh, Amazon Music, iHeart Radio, Overcast, and a lot more. So wherever you listen to podcasts, just simply search for the It Came From Gen X podcast. Pull us up and either follow or subscribe, however the app works you're listening on. And as we post new episodes weekly, they'll pop into your podcast library free of charge and listen to us whenever you want to on the go on the way to go see an elvis uh, impersonator or whatever you want to do we're there for you whenever you want you might be watching us on youtube our youtube channel it came from gen x or the boss code media network we're proud to be a part of find the app on your smart tv or portable device pull them up Give them a subscribe, and we are there on our very own channel. It came from Gen X channel, and there's a lot of other creative uh, uh, content uh, artists out there as well, chefs, comedians, musicians, a lot of good stuff there in the Boss Code Media Network. All show information can be found in two main places, our link tree. Just simply Google, it came from Gen X link tree, or vice versa. You simply get a page with links to our social media and places you can listen to us. And our website, it came from genx.wordpress.com. All show information's there, links to new episodes, videos, promos, bios, and ways you can support the show as well. Our Patreon uh, uh, website link is on our website. And also you may support the show now on our main podcast page, anchor.fm. It came from Gen X. You can find a link to that as well on our website and other social media. If you may, uh, if you wish to uh, donate to Keith's uh, technical lessons for troubled teens, you may do so there also. Best things that you do is rate, review the show on podcasts, give us a nice review and a rating, helps others find the show, subscribe, follow, and tell a friend. That's how we grow out there. So that's it. Appreciate your support. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening. Yeah, this show is brought to you by www.donastporterfortechnicalhelp.com. That's right. By the way. That's right. All right. So, you like uh, Fist said, you can find us on Boss Code Media. Go to your Apple or Google Play Store and look, check it out. All right. Indeed. So some world news we're going to go to the state a uh, good old state of kentucky today mm -hmm. and have you heard about now these guys are not the first to do this but have you heard about them you understand what narcan is right it's the medication that cops and first responders use for people that are overdosing uh particularly with opiates okay there is been a vending machine filled with narcan dose one dose or one package which has two doses free to anybody that should need it we go to pine grove i'm sorry vine grove vine with the v as a mm -hmm. victor they set up on a thursday a uh, vending machine full of these doses of narcan they put a camera up on the ceiling just so they can monitor, make sure some that not one person go in there and grab 50, 50 boxes of or 100 doses of this and goes and sell it on the street. Um, they open it up. Uh, they did a ribbon cutting at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday. They announced it on their citywide platform, like Chicago Falls has Talk of the Town on Facebook. They did it, whatever they have there, at 6 p.m. on Thursday. By 6 p.m. on Friday, that machine was wiped clean. Wow. couple things with that. You First thing I thought before I, I kept on reading was, okay, who went in there and grabbed 100 doses and now they're selling it on the streets? Well, when I read that they did, the, the chief of police did set up a camera coming down on the, the machine, 
because I wanted to check to see, okay, well, first of all, who's doing, who's you coming to get this stuff? They wanted to get some, some, uh, whether it's, you know, man, woman, old, young, mm-hmm. you know, all walks of, all walks of life. But, um, they were saying that most everybody came in and grabbed either one or two boxes. They would read the information on the box and then they would, they would go away. Hmm. So it was comforting that it wasn't uh, just one person going in and wiping the machine clean, but what is bothersome to me, and I thought this was just astronomical when it comes to numbers. In 2021, there was 90, let me find it here real quick, 91,799 deaths due to overdose from opiates in the United States, still in 2021. In Kentucky alone, they had 2,000 and what is it? 2,200 and some change, just a nurse state alone. I can't believe this is still going on. I mean, I can, but I can't. You don't hear it as much in the news. It's not the, not the you know top stories in the news anymore. But I'd never heard of a vending machine dispensing this Narcan, which I'm glad it's free, first of all, because normally Mm -hmm. you have to go to the store or you can buy this stuff at, I guess, at a drugstore, but you got to pay money for this stuff. Sure. Um, You don't want to call. There's people, you know, your buddy's having an overdose. Do you really want to call the police and say, we need somebody here with Narcan? a lot of times they're going to think they're going to get arrested or something's going to happen. So they're going to fail to do that. By the time it's too late, your, your buddy's dead. So mm-hmm. I appreciate that there's this, what I don't understand or what I couldn't believe is that this is not the first place to have these machines. Um, let's see, Las Vegas, New York city, San Diego, Austin, Texas, and Detroit have all, public published uh findings that they had these machines in place um so i'm mind blown that this is still going on i i I know the drugs the opiates is still an issue i didn't realize it was at this detailed of an uh this strong of an issue still um you know we family we had two of our two of our people in our family that got hooked on um heroin and that was a long haul. They're both have been now sober for quite a long time. Um, but I know what we went through during that time, and it's no fun, no fun at all. So have you heard about the story? Do you have any thoughts on this? Are you as mind blown as I am that this is still a, a major issue going on? I haven't heard of this until you mentioned it to the pre-show. Um, Am I mind blown that there's still a problem with open? No, I'm not mind blown by it. I mean, it's. I think it's a. I, don't, I think it's a good a good thing overall. I mean, it, uh, you know, s- certainly you hope that people can find their way to getting off the drugs uh, with treatment, etc. There's plenty of people though that, you know. They they don't find their way there. They don't explore it. They, for various reasons, I don't know. So I, I guess what I'm saying is that just to think that people should just get off drugs, and that's how you cure everything, and or you know you punish people for taking drugs and throw them in jail and this and that and the other. It's not going to stop the the problem, right? So you know you're hearing more of these. Um, you know, it's, it's not a solution, but more of these of these support type systems, I guess, to just you know keep people alive. You know, you, if someone could stay alive, you know, and you mentioned there's several situations where people just wouldn't have access to this, and it'd be too late, or they're they you know they they should take it and they don't because, like you say, they're worried about the other repercussions and this and that. It's something going to save some lives, and you hope that if someone's around another day or they they, they find their way to uh, a better place in their life, you know. So there's other cre- there's other things out there that um, you know. There's like controlled places where people can go and shoot up cleanly and have be monitored and stuff like that. That sounds really bizarre and strange, but um, again, but it's it's those types of things keep people alive, keeps them from. You know, and, and if you need this stuff, you know, and you don't have the money for it, right? 
what might you do in desperation? I mean, you might not the drug itself, but if you're desperate to get something like this, maybe you turn to crime or maybe you do something else to where you're harming others, but now you have access to something that can save your life or a loved one's life who's uh, on drugs. So I don't know. It's not the answer completely, but I, it does make sense to me to offer more of these controlled uh, uh, support uh, right. mechanisms, I guess, to, to help people out there that are struggling. So, you know, it's it's a shame, but overall... Like I said, I think it's a good thing. So what do you think? I, I think it's a great thing that the machines are out there. I'm just, you know, yeah, you just can't say nobody should do drugs and it, it'll just go away because mm-hmm. you know, I know it's never going to go away. As long as there's drugs on earth, people are going to, you know, be chasing the high, mm-hmm. you know, this, that, or another. So if there's a, a way for people to, you're when you're in that state of mind, getting high and doing this, the farthest thing from your mind is, okay, how can I do this and be safe? That's not a thought. That's not in the thought process. You know, if there's, this is out there and the friends and family members are able to obtain the support, um, these vending machines, things like that, it's a great thing, you know, but the people themselves that are in the, like I said, the the drug users uh, themselves, that's the farthest thing they're thinking about is is their safety. So um, I, I'm glad it's out there. Mind blown that there's still so many overdose deaths out there. But I am glad to see that there's a means to helping people that wasn't there before. So interesting story. And I appreciate your, appreciate your objective uh, perspective on that. So Absolutely. With Mr. Porter being gone, we will now switch gears and uh, talk some sports and music. You want to go ahead and start with sports? You want me to go ahead and start with this day in music? Uh, We start a little bit of sports. A lot of lot of big sports news in our area. Of course, we're in Northeast Ohio. If you listen to the show at all, you know that. So we're in the uh, Akron area, not far from Cleveland. So uh, why don't you start with the huge, huge baseball news in the area? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm pimping the the tribe, as I call them, the Cleveland baseball team. Mm -hmm. Uh, They are on to the... (laughs) Excuse me. The boss is going to yell at me for that, having to fix that, but... uh, I still can't get rid of this cough. Um, the tribe took two from Tampa Bay to move on to which they start their series in New York on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Um, they had seven hits in two games and swept the series. So the, what does that tell you as far as the pitching is concerned? The pitching for both teams was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Cleveland won two to one on uh, game one and then one to nothing in 15 innings. Mm-hmm. It's the longest no-score extra innings game in the history of uh, postseason, which is pretty oh. crazy. Yeah. And then a rookie comes up in the fifteenth inning with his walk-on uh, his his walk-on <laughs> song, this SpongeBob SquarePants theme song. Love it. And the irony in all this is uh, Corey Kluber, who was pitched uh, most of his career for Cleveland Indians. Was the pitcher on the mound that gave I, up the home run? Okay, I thought that was him. I watched the game. Yeah. I'm like, is that the same Corey Kluber that? Oh my! Yeah, God. it was his Corey post- Kluber who pitched for <laughs> Cleveland and won a couple Cy Youngs for him. So his postseason with, with Cleveland was always not the best, and it just, I guess, it continued in Cleveland with this. Oh man, poor guy. Right. Oh well. Yeah, man. felt bad. My dad is a huge Corey Kluber fan, and he felt real bad. He says, "You know what, son? But a win is a win. I'll take it off of any pitcher that's, uh, that's coming right. up against that's him." So. Right. Um, so yeah, the hmm. uh, d- the division series are set. Um, the Mets had a epic collapse. They had won a hundred games this year and got swept by uh, the San Diego Padres, seven to nothing in the first game, and then they got beat up pretty good last night as well. Hmm. Um, let's see, Seattle Mariners took it to Toronto, another good team with Toronto. Um, didn't have a pr- didn't even have a chance, and then uh, the Phillies beat. The St. Louis Cardinals. St. Louis Cardinals was winning two to nothing in Game One, 
went up in the ninth inning and gave up six runs, and I never mm. looked, uh, Philly never looked back. So, mm. so you got uh, you got Houston playing the Seattle Mariners. You got the Yankees playing the Cleveland Guardians. You've got uh, Atlanta playing the Philadelphia Phillies, and San Diego Padres are playing the Los Angeles Angels. Mm. Not Angels, Los Angeles Dodgers. So it's going to be a fun series, uh, baseball-wise, uh, to say the least. Um, I'm a huge Cleveland baseball team. I still have an issue, and my son, uh, Mike Jr., who's uh, our podcast producer, uh, the boss, as we call him, he's like, Dad, you're so silly not calling them by their real name. I said, son, it's just <laughs> the way it is. They're the Cleveland baseball team to me, but I was still root for them. So, uh, but, yeah, great uh, great weekend for baseball, um, for baseball fans. College football, no surprises there. The, um, Ohio State looked to be the number one team in the land, yet they are still ranked number two for whatever reason. Um, but uh, did you catch any college football this weekend at all? I watched some of the Buckeye game out and about. really mm-hmm. wasn't that close of a game. And no. Alabama struggled. Yeah. Alabama should not have won that game. They should have two losses in the books. They should have lost to Texas, and they should have lost this past weekend. But uh, somehow they've gone unscathed. They've been pretty lucky so far. Our state looks good. Offense is really heating up. I mean, it is still like a pretty – they'll be a tough out in the playoffs, that's for sure. We'll see if they can compete with the top couple of this year so far. Looks like they'll have a shot to at least compete in the playoffs versus prior years where they got on and just get – you know, wiped out uh, quickly. So well, but, right now they're ranked number one offense in the country and number seventh overall defense in okay. the country. That's pretty hard to beat by anybody. So, um, what do you? You've got a little bit about uh, with the NFL. There was uh, some heartache and some surprises uh, in the NFL. Um, first one I'll, I'll, I'll mention is Green Bay losing to the Giants over across the pond. Did you catch any of that at all? I did not see. I saw a little bit of the highlights. Um, New York's kind of a surprising team. I mean, they lost to Dallas. Right. Even, you know, Dallas defense looking pretty good. But, uh, yeah, New York's kind of a surprise team. So you get the NFC East, by the way, is kind of a surprising uh, division. The only undefeated team is Philadelphia, 5-0. Mm-hmm. and And then both Dallas and the Giants are 4-1. and And the Commanders are kind of out of it. But, uh yeah, I think it's one of the best overall records um, of all the divisions with those three I, they teams. They went so. from the worst division in football last year to, I think, the best division of football right now. Truthfully, yeah, pretty amazing. So it's that it, every game in that division right now between those three teams obviously means a whole lot. And you got right. uh, Dallas and Philadelphia playing next Sunday evening, so it'll be an interesting right. matchup. Yeah, it'll be a good game. Uh, the Browns, I, I I made a mention that the Browns can't get out of their way to win a uh, to stop losing these games they shouldn't. And I said Baltimore and Cincinnati are not much better. And then the last phrase, of course, was Steelers just suck. <laughs> but poor Steeler Nation, man, they are just licking their wounds because that team is not good um, defensively, offensively. They just and it's been a long time coming. They've been good. I'll give them credit where credit's due. They've been good for a long time, or they've been competitive for a long time. This year, mm-hmm. if they win five games, I think it's going to be a good season for them. And it's hard to say that for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, I'm with you. I think uh, you know Cleveland very easily should be four and one with two games. They should have won every chance to win yesterday, and they should have beat the Jets with that. Uh, monumental uh, collapse that they had. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I couldn't believe the, 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 the call of the Chargers yesterday to go for it on fourth down. One at the 39-yard line, their own 39-yard yeah. line. And Cleveland still Cleveland. doesn't win. Nope. Cleveland, it's, it, it's shocking they even had a chance. Just poor coaching, poor execution right now. So I think uh, uh, Stephane, even though Deshaun Watson's not in there, it's not really – the quarterback play that's causing Clayton I, you know, no, he made a big interception. Yesterday. Yeah. Def, you know, but a lot of the things, a lot of other factors there from Cleveland not playing so well. I think it's, I think it's the fancy he's got 
I don't know. At the end of this year, I think they're going to sit back and reevaluate uh, if they want to give it one more year or not. Yeah. So. Well, I don't have a problem with Stefanski. I have a problem with him being the play caller for the offense. I think he yeah. needs to step aside and be the head coach and let yeah. his let his staff take care of the rest. Yeah. But uh, did you see the um, the call where Tom Brady? Well, got sacked, and the they called a roughing the passer on a general, just a tackle. Did you uh, see that play at all? It was I absolutely saw the headlines. I read about it a little bit. Call. I saw that this morning, and I could not believe that they called a roughing the passer on this. He just grabbed him by the waist and tackled him, and he spun him around. He dropped to the ground. He didn't drive him to the ground. He didn't spear him. He just grabbed him by the waist and flipped him and and and. They called 15 yards. So they, if the NFL is not trying to protect at all costs Tom Brady and his legacy, I don't know what is. So mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot of people that are, you know, I'm not a huge Tom Brady fan. You know, I respect his game. I'm tired of hearing about him. I wish he would retire and move on, let the young kids play. I, you know, I, that's been been said many times by me. But, it, you know, when, when he's favored by the referees and it's – the NFL is not stepping in and saying, "Hey, he needs to be treated just like anybody else." I've got a problem with that, but um, yeah, I do I, like. I mean, I, I I hate to say it, but I I do like a lot of the rules that they put in place to protect the quarterback within reason. Within reason. Within reason, because obviously, if these if the starting you name the quarterback, it's not not for me. It's not necessarily a Tom Brady thing, right? But just you, you know, it, 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 if you can extend. The, the life of a starting NFL quarterback than it does, obviously, is what, the, what they're thinking. It does keep the game more exciting than if you're having guys get hurt left and right, like we've seen many guys in our time with their careers shortened because of the, the rules at the time. Um, so I do like that, but not where it gets a little crazy, where it's pretty blatant that – I mean, you got to let defense play some defense as well. I mean, if the guy's not trying to drill the quarterback and harm him, if it's just a normal hit, I mean, come on. I mean, you got to you got to draw a line there somewhere. Right. Yeah, I'll have to try to find that video and send it to you. You're just going to shake your head as to like I did as to why it why it happened. So, anything else for sports? So we can wrap it up and move on. Um, basketball's getting ready to go. Hockey's getting ready to go. Uh, right now, I think the two big things is NFL, of course, and college football, and the baseball season, uh, you know, division series gets started uh, in a couple of days. So, be interesting yeah, to see here. how this all w- rolls out. Yeah, it'll be definitely interesting. It's just it, in the Cleveland area a few months ago. You know, who, who would have thought that of all the teams to be super excited about, it would be not the Cleveland Browns. It would be. <laughs> The Cleveland Guardians, right, and the Cleveland Cavs to be even more. Of course, the Cavs have been getting better and better with, but getting getting Donovan Mitchell into the lineup, we have a lot of things, a lot of reasons to be excited for Cleveland sports, non football at this right. uh, you know, juncture. So, and to be excited about the Cavs without LeBron James being involved. So, absolutely. Yeah, it's, I may watch a little bit of. I didn't watch any games last year in the NBA. Didn't even watch the playoffs. But I think. With all the hype with the Cleveland and with you know, like you said, Donovan Mitchell being uh, coming across, I think I may watch a few games to see if they're the real deal. Like it, absolutely you know, on paper, it says they are. So, all right. So moving on to music, not a lot going on in this day in music. Uh, I know you've got a couple things to talk about. A couple birthdays to note: uh, born today, uh, Sharon Osbourne. Uh, you know, Mrs. Ozzy Osbourne was born today mm-hmm. in 1955, or sorry, 1953. Uh, Miss Tanya Tucker was born on this day in 1955, along with uh, the man himself, David Lee Roth from Van Halen. Uh, mm. They they all uh, born both of those two born today in 1955. David Lee Roth. Gotta love the guy. He's my favorite of the two. I didn't mind Sammy Hagar, and there's always the talk, you know, are you Van Hagar? Are you David Lee Roth? You know, uh, 
Which era do you prefer? I like them both, to be truthful. I don't have a favorite. I know you and I, uh, we went with Coopers to see the band um, at Lock 3. And forgive me, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on their name right now, but they were the... Atomic Punks. Atomic Punks. They play the David Lee Roth era. Mm-hmm. And, um, boy, they were very good. Uh, brought back a lot of memories on the songs that they played. Um but I don't have a favorite. I like a lot of the Van Halen with Sammy Hagar as a front man, but I do like a lot of the old stuff. I don't know what your preference is with that. Um, but um, just two different bands completely. Uh, I mean, if you just if you didn't know, you know, just no one told you okay, I'm going to play two different two band two bands for you. If you didn't know that it was the same band playing, you might not even realize it. You know, if you were just a kind of a casual music fan, but of the two, I mean, I definitely prefer the classic Van Halen uh-huh. with David Lee Roth. David Lee Roth was the best frontman period ever, hands uh-huh. down. He understood his he understood his role. He understood that he's not playing an instrument out there. He's going to be entertaining in other ways, running around the stage. He was a, he had good banter. He was incredibly athletic. I mean, he uh-huh. could. You know, he could do high kicks, and he was into martial arts and stuff like that. He could twirl the mic stand. He would go out there with a sword and stuff. He did all kinds of crazy stuff out there on right. stage, and he was good. He could sing. I mean, he's not the best singer that's ever existed, certainly, but for what he did in that band, they were incredible. It's just, it's, it's a real shame that they didn't put out more music with, with him. him. They, they, right. They had a lot of uh, stints where they just didn't put out new albums. It just they took their time after the first couple albums to put new stuff out there. So and that's nice been a knock more. on them all along as they didn't have enough with David Lee Roth. Absolutely. So Sam Hagar is great, like you say. He's he's talented in his own way. You know, it's a whole different vibe and feel. And mm-hmm. the guy could you know write incredible music and sing and play. Great guitar and all that. Just, just, just two different bands. But I, I give me David Lee Roth. That's all right. it. All right. Um, and this not a lot going on in this day of music. Um, the what I thought was didn't realize um, John Bonham from Led Zeppelin died at thirty two years old. Yeah. I didn't realize he was that young when he passed away. Uh, today in 1980 was his funeral for uh, for his passing. Um, at, at, again, at age 32. Um, a lot of number ones uh, during this time. Uh, Steven Tyler with Aerosmith was injured in a cherry bomb uh, accident, was thrown on stage during a gig in Philadelphia. I don't remember that. Um Somebody threw a cherry bomb on stage, and it. Um, Joe Perry and Steve Tyler, both from Aerosmith, were injured. I'm surprised I didn't hear more about that. I was pretty young back then, but I don't recall that ever happening. Um, let's see. White Snake went to number one with "Here I Go Again," which was one of their big, big, big songs. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Police was number one with "Ghost in the Machine" back in 1981. Was you a Police fan? I I did like some of their stuff. I, some I, of their yeah, stuff, not a lot of it though. The, for more me. the more the older stuff, the Synchronicity yeah. album that that was sort of like their huge pop hit, you know, with uh, um, uh, I'm always watching. It was I can't was it what the heck was it? Uh, Every breath oh, you take, you try to say. Yeah, that I was got a one. huge yeah. huge smash for them. But that was mm-hmm. just different. But some of the old classic police stuff is is it's good stuff. Very right. talented musicians, those guys. One last thing in 1999, going back to Elvis Presley, there was a charity auction selling off his belongings was held at the Grand Hotel in Las Vegas. A uh, couple items to note: a uh, wristwatch was sold for thirty-two thousand, a uh, simple cigar box for twenty-five grand, autographed baseball sold for nineteen thousand, and his Lincoln Continental. 1956, they sold for $250,000 back in wow. 1999. That's a lot of money for 1999. So um, not a lot in music. Um, we did have a passing you're going to talk about here. So let's go ahead and move into uh, some uh, pop culture. Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Show will return after these messages. 
Bang, bang, bang. Oh, howdy, partner. Time for timer. Do you ever get that hungry feeling after school? Boy, I do. I'm so hungry, I could eat a wagon wheel. When I'm slow on the draw and I need something to chaw, I hanker for a hunk of cheese. When my ten gallon hats are feeling five gallons flat, I got something planned, which is little cheese sandwiches. Come on! Here's a great little snack to tide you over till dinner. If you want something delicious and nutritious, cheese is a super snack. Look, a wagon wheel. When my get up and go has got up and went, I hanker for a hunk of cheese. When I'm dancing, I hold down and my boots kind of slow down or any time I'm weak in the knees. I hanker for a hunk of, a slaver slice a chunk of, a snacker that is a winner and yet won't spoil my dinner. I hanker for a hunk of cheese. All right, sir. One thing I will mention with, uh, we looked at uh, pop culture uh, history, uh, October the 12th, back in 1997, was the the fateful plane crash of the great John Denver, 53 wow. years of age. So he was, a, he was a pilot, and he was, I guess he was flying a plane he wasn't as familiar with, mm -hmm. and he flew out and crashed. So... Um, I still was, remember that when that happened. Yeah, so Crazy you know, obviously huge, huge star in the seventies, predominantly. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of, lot of hits. Um, you know, Country Road. I mean, you know, they got him a country boy. He was known for that folksy type stuff. Mm -hmm. So, right, yeah, very, very good stuff. Were you a John Denver fan, Skinner? What do you think about this? Uh, music? Yeah, I grew up with John Denver. My mom was a big country fan, so he was one of those fixtures on the country radio um back in the late 70s early 80s uh so yeah yeah huge john denver fan and like i said I, ironically enough i still remember hearing the news when he did pass it seems like it was so long ago but yet i can still remember it like it was yesterday yeah crazy it just a feel good music he had you yeah know? he had very good family wholesome that's what country music you weren't talking about your dog running away or the, you know your wife left you or the truck uh, you know the, the, the old cliches with country music it was good wholesome family very catchy music that he had and yeah. uh, i always remember him for that absolutely uh and speaking of uh, country music as well as you alluded to uh lost a huge 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 one of the uh most iconic country singers that ever lived arguably mm -hmm. uh loretta lynn passed away uh october the 4th so we're shooting this october the 10th so just last week age 90 uh, six decade career in country music amazing uh i mean it's, it's, if you even if you're a casual fan you know some of her Music and her huge hit, uh, Coal Miner's Daughter, um, in 1980, the film Coal, Coal Miner's Daughter, the right. same name was, was made based on her life with Sissy Spacek, I believe. Sissy, played, yeah, you know? Sissy Spacek played in that, yep. Yeah, so she, let's see here, she's the only female ACM artist of the decade in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. She had 24 number one singles and 11 number one albums. And she ended 57 years of touring on the road after she suffered a stroke back in 2017 and then broke her hip in 2018. So it took a stroke and breaking a hip to get her off the road. Uh, but just obviously tremendous, tremendous career. Uh, great music. Um, so obviously you're more of a country fan than I am, but I do like some some classic country stuff there. What, do you, we, uh -huh. what are your thoughts on the great uh, Loretta Lynn Skinner? Anybody that has ever listened to any kind of music will know Loretta Lynn. I don't care if you don't listen to country, you listen to you know any type of genre, you're going to know who Loretta who Loretta Lynn is. It's it's like Garth Brooks with country music or the Beatles with pop and, and rock and roll. You don't have to know music to know these people. Uh, she was one of those. I grew up listening to country with my mom. Um, it was the old Whistler's radio station, if you recall, back in the 80s. Oh, yeah. That's before right. yep. it became WQMX, which is still on the air today, 94.9 in the Akron 
Canton area. Um, she was always on there. Her songs, that coal miner's daughter was a great film. If you've never seen it, the music is spectacular. If you, especially if you're an old country fan, but the, mm-hmm. it's a good movie, great story. If you've not seen it, or if you have, don't remember it, go back and revisit that movie. It, it'll be worth your while. I will do that. And you think of an artist like that, you know, I, I would have to imagine so many female country singers since had mm-hmm. to have been influenced by Loretta Lynn and oh, without uh, question. Motiv- motivated them to give it a shot, you know, and, uh, you know, since that, it, you know, we, we definitely had some iconic female country singers, you know, uh, way back, but, uh, um, I feel like it's more more commonplace to have is more and more uh, female artists who are making it big in country music, and um, you know certainly Loretta Lynn was one that helped pave the uh, pave the way. So yeah, you've got Loretta Lynn, you got Tanya Tucker, who we've talked about. Happy birthday to her today, mm-hmm. Reba McIntyre, and most recently would be Carrie Underwood. Those four sure. ladies are the big ones um, that all female artists today strive to be. Is one Absolutely. Of those four. Sure. Dolly, Crystal Gale has been Dolly, tons, tons Crystal of Dolly, Crystal Gale, yes. You, thank you. Those are two other names that you put in that conversation. Yeah. So, absolutely. Yeah. Right, well, very good. Well, rest in peace, uh, Loretta Lynn. Yeah, we remember uh, Bob Denver. We did lose another uh, person from our uh, our generation, a comedian, Judy Tenuta. I remember her in the 80s and the 90s. There, so she was a funny comedian, uh, 72 years of age. Uh, but I remember her coming out with an accordion, and she would like tell a joke and play the accordion a little bit, mm-hmm. and she would uh, call herself like a princess uh, and and stuff. So uh, she was in a couple of cameos and movies, I think, and stuff. But just kind of a brash comic and. Uh, I was sad to hear of her passing. You mentioned you're not that familiar with her. No, I not very. I I didn't know the name, but I I remember the act with the accordion being a comedian. Um, but yeah, not very familiar, unfortunately. But uh, okay. needless to say, uh, you know, nonetheless, rest in peace. Um, I mean, she's pretty popular back then. I kind of looked her up after you had mentioned her uh, at pre-show uh, meeting. So, okay. Yeah, rest in peace, Judy Tenuta. Um, they're making a new documentary. Now, we mentioned last week we were talking about the the debut of the Captain Kangaroo show was around, was last week in pop culture history. Right. And we're sort of comparing other children's shows. And, you know, one that keeps coming up is sort of a, you know, a children's show from our generation when we had young kids that maybe we dreaded a little bit was uh, Barney. So a little bit. <laughs> Man, I had to put I had to put noise canceling earphones on when that show came on the TV. Oh. So I love you, you love me. So there, there a new uh, documentary is coming out uh, soon uh, called "I Love You, You Hate Me." Uh, it's going to be on uh, Peacock. And I think NBC. So right. it explores how uh, throughout the 90s or 2000s, uh, uh, Barney turned into a cultural punching bag. So they're going to interview the guy who was the voice of Barney for many years, Bob West. So he was a veteran before. He did the voice of Barney from 1992 to 2000. So the Oof. I love you, you love me, that's Bob West. Uh, voice, wow. and they just explore how to something so innocent that's supposed to be you know, a good thing for kids just became uh, kind of hated by adults with the you know crazy kids and the annoyances. I, I don't know. So I think it's interesting. I think it's a fascinating story that you've already mentioned that it was something that you did not look forward to in the house. Are you interested in this? Uh, docu series and, and why was you hate it so much? What was what was it? What did you hate about Barney so much? It's not the I don't I think hate hate is a it is not a good word to use. There are television shows that are that have gone on in cartoons 
uh, and our kids. I'm trying to remember the Rugrats was one of those. Sure, where cartoon. Yep. The cartoon Rugrats, where kids absolutely loved, but they also threw in every once in a while a line that adults would would understand, sure. would yep. keep them interested in. Uh, Homer Simpson's one. Uh, they threw a lot of adult stuff in there for to keep people interested in. Um, Scooby Doo did a lot for do with that. Even Fred Flintstone going way back. They mm -hmm. they kept the adult population that had to watch these shows with children engaged. Barney didn't do a lot of that, and I think that was the downfall for that show. They catered to the children, and that's all they cared about is that those children would be happy. My kids loved it. I'm not gonna lie, they loved Barney. Um, you know, it was what did you say, ninety two to two thousand. Mm -hmm. Michael was born in ninety three, and uh, Chelsea was born in ninety seven. So that growing up. You know, Chelsea bounced from Barney to uh, the uh, Teletubbies. Those were her two favorite television shows. So um, I, don't, I, I don't say it was hatred, it, 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 but it was the fact that didn't, they didn't engage the adults. And I think that was the only downfall to Barney and why hmm. they're, they're considered, like you said, a punching bag. Because they did take it on the chin a lot, especially from the adult population. Should they, though? I mean, should those shows necessarily... If it's a kid's show, should they cater to the adults somehow, some way? Or, no, it's perfectly okay that it's catered to kids. I don't necessarily want to watch it. Right. But No, I agree with you. I, I, I don't think they needed to cater to adults, but I think that's where the, the line is. And why see. you have the adults that hated it so much, or like I said... I couldn't stand it, to be truthful. It, it, there was just nothing with that show that engaged me whatsoever. So I think that's why I come across, you know, as the term hate or hatred. Um, but no, they, their their market was young children, and they they did it very well. There's no question okay. about that. I get you. So I, I have to – I'm putting this on for my kid. My kid loves it. But there is zero in here that is – appealing to me at all and so right. that's sort of the line in yeah this show's not for me it's for kids but so, as there's nothing at all for the adults then it's just sort of a uh oh my gosh my kid wants to have this on and i sort of have to listen to it and hear it and see it i i get you okay yeah, yeah peyton was not much of a barney person for you know around uh, growing up uh she was more of a door the explorer and a few things like that which had its own annoyances in its own way as well. Don't right. don't get me wrong. So, swiper no swiping. That's God, right. I'll, I'll never That's forget right. that phrase. That's right. I'm the map. I'm <laughs> yeah. the map. I'm the map. I'm the map. Yep. Okay. Um, you know, Cheech and Chong were certainly very big in the uh, late, mid to late seventies and mm. very early eighties. You know, certainly they, you know, they had a, a stand-up act was uh, very popular. They had tons of uh, comedy albums. They had some uh, stoner movies. Uh, the the original stoner humor was, uh, I think, definitely Cheech and Chong would be right at the top of the list as far as marijuana humor and, and oh, drug yeah. humor and all that stuff. They mm -hmm. had a lot of uh, popular movies back in the day. I'm sure we saw some. I know I did some on Up cable. Up Smoke comes to mind. Up in Smoke, Nice Dreams, and a few other ones. It was just the kind of the running joke. These guys are high and goofing. Anyway, the Cheech Marin, he, he, did, he did other things as well. Uh, he had some uh, television shows and different things mm -hmm. that he did. Uh, so very popular in his own right. But I thought this was interesting. He made the news uh, recently in uh, over the summer. He opened up a the Cheech Marin Center for Chicano Art and Culture, also known as the Cheech which was a nickname for himself. Um, and he's simply, he's showcasing Chicano artwork. Uh, so it's kind of giving another avenue uh, for folks to be able to display their art that maybe might have a hard time displaying elsewhere or otherwise. So I just thought it was pretty cool. And he said it's the most positive thing he's ever been involved in his entire career. So it's, it's a nice, yeah, it's a nice opportunity for him to be able to give back to his community. Um, and he said where he's at, it's in a community. It's in Riverside. It's, 
it's about 53% Latino. And, um, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. So what, what are your thoughts on Cheech Marin opening up a art gallery? I think it's fantastic. Something that's, uh, you know, positive for them. You know, they, they were a great, fun group to watch. I just I say group. They were a duet. Cheech and Chong, mm-hmm. the movies were, you go back and watch them today. It's like, oh God, why was these popular? <laughs> <laughs> to be truthful, but they were, you know, they, they had a following and they mm-hmm. brought out the negative side towards marijuana use, I guess is the best way to put it. And it's, Cheech has done a lot of stuff. He's been in a lot of television programs since Cheech and Chong days. Uh, mm-hmm. He's done some serious roles, which he's done. He's a pretty good actor in his own right, but uh, love that he's done something for his uh, Latino group, uh, something he has a passion for and he's being successful. So I'm very happy for him. Yeah, it's very cool. You can still find Cheech and Chong out there with TikTok and different things out there. Still perform, they still do some things out there right. uh, together. So I think it's very cool. Um, before I get to my last story here, I did skip a segment because we we're talking about some passings and all that here. Uh, Gen X uh, recommendation, media recommendation. So have you watched, heard, seen anything that you want to recommend to our viewers and listeners out there skinner yeah um uh, real quick uh mr porter mentioned uh sweet girl with jason's uh mimosa mimosa yeah momoa momoa sorry um me and miss marcy watched that actually yesterday fantastic movie very very good recommendation Mm -hmm. uh we are about eight uh seven or eight episodes into television show called dead to me it's on netflix um Mm -hmm. christina applegate is the lead character in this she is a widow uh she befriends or uh, she becomes friends with a woman at a um what do they call it it's a um at a group that um a group she attends uh, a grief counseling group Okay. Well, come the twist is the the woman is the person who had hit and run for her husband. I'll just leave it at that. So we're about seven episodes in, starting to give out more information. Uh, they give you a little piece by piece information on each uh, each episode. Waiting for the cliffhanger for season one to end. I, I think there's two seasons right now, but uh, pretty interesting. Uh, okay. Didn't see this coming to be truthful. So yeah, pretty good show so far. All right, very good. Well, this being in the uh, October season, there's a lot of creepy shows and things out there, so I, that's sort of my mood. Um, I like that stuff anyway, but I tend to watch more of that in October, probably like a lot of folks here. So a couple right. things I watched. Uh, I did see the Rob Zombie Monsters movie. Did you? Uh, on Netflix. Okay. I, I talked about it on the uh, Convincing Idiots podcast as well, but... Uh, Honestly, just as in my opinion, it's a story that didn't really care about in the sense of, you know, watching the series, loved the series as a kid, still love it today. Uh, I didn't necessarily need to know how Lily and Herman met. I didn't need to know how they got to 1313 Mockingbird Way. I All that stuff, I don't really care about. The funny part about that, and one of the funniest things about that series was the interactions with them and normal people that mm-hmm. the monsters found found weird and bizarre. They they found normal people weird and bizarre, and it's kind of scary. Obviously, people found them scary. That right. was some of the funnier parts of that series was those interactions. And in my opinion, this the movie just took too long to get them to the house that we all know and love, and there was very little interactions with quote unquote normal people. So so they missed the ball on that one. I, I think so a little bit. Rob Zombie's truly a fan. He definitely pays a lot of respect and homage to the original series. He was mm-hmm. he's not making fun of anything. It just it was you know, it's there if you're looking for a you know, hour and a half watch. If you love the monsters, there's probably something in this that you will find enjoyable. Don't get me wrong. It just me personally, I would rather seeing them already in the house doing, you know, 
just getting into some type of you know weird, funny adventure mm-hmm. with quote unquote normal people, if you right. will. So, ah. yeah, it sucks that they fell short on that one. Or at least that's what it sounds like. I still may yeah. give it a look, though. Yeah, I think it had a lot of build up, and then they were going to release it. I think maybe even in the, in the theater at one point or another, and really just come all the way down to. Uh, NBC Peacock sold the rights to Netflix, and that's just kind of where it is uh, at the moment. Sounds like I it might watch, have been the right thing to do. <laughs> probably. I, I don't think it would have hit in the theater at all. Hmm. Um, I watched the entire Jeffrey Dahmer series, Monster, on Netflix. Uh, just definitely takes you back to that, you know, when, when all that came out in the news in the early 90s and the, the, the horrific things. Evan Peters plays Jeffrey Dahmer, does a great job in this. Him and uh, uh, Nisi Nash. Uh, yeah, Nisi Nash uh, is in it. Plays Glenn to Cleveland, his neighbor. So just, if you like, it's just, it's, it, it, you definitely have to be in the mood for it, certainly. It's, also, uh, Molly Ringwald was in it. Yes. Played, yeah, she played uh, played his stepmother. Je- yes. Which I saw pictures of her, and I'm like, wow, that doesn't even look like her. You know, yeah, she so was, just, she's our generation actress. So oh, it's kind of, kind of weird to see her play that kind of role. Yeah, she did a great job in it as well. But uh, if you're at all curious about the story, you know, it's not obviously, it's not for the faint of heart. Right. Horrible, horrible things. Uh, but I just. Like I said, it was very interesting, and like I said, the, the storyline, the, the acting was great. So if you like that sort of thing, you'll definitely enjoy the Dahmer series. And last night, I watched the new Werewolf by Night special on Disney+. Plus. The Werewolf by Night is a Marvel Comics uh, character. Uh, it was kind of like the 70s. Marvel got into some of these like darker heroes and stories. And I think that's where Moon Knight made his debut was in the original Werewolf by Night comic okay. series back mm-hmm. in its time. He might have been hunting the werewolf or something along that line, Moon Knight, but uh very good. It's a it's an hour long. Uh they shoot it like an old monster movie, so you definitely have the feel of like watching an old universal monster movie. Uh it's definitely not for kids. It's definitely an adult themed special some mm-hmm. violence and different things. But uh, if you like the old monster movies, you like that sort of vibe and feel, you will enjoy this. A lot of fun. Uh, so go check out uh, Werewolf by Night on Disney+. Plus. Get you definitely in the Halloween spirit, for sure. Okay. So speaking of spooky stuff, some of the most, most well-known characters, and you mentioned a little bit even uh, in this episode, the beloved Scooby-Doo gang, uh, one of our favorite cartoons growing up, for sure. Uh, they've been around in different... It's just they're so popular. They've, they've, they've made live-action movies. There's been all kinds, of course, different series and mm-hmm. takes on the Scooby-Doo gang. They've done a pup named Scooby-Doo. They've, you know, they've been on Saturday mornings for years. So much. There's actually going to be a new Velma series on HBO Max, uh, starting Mindy Kenner. Uh, Mindy, who's, who was on The Office. Um, but there's a new Scooby-Doo movie coming out soon. And it's making a lot of uh, social media news because in the movie, Velma is interested in another woman. So now, if you search right now, Velma on social media, you will get on Google all kinds of pride flags and things that, that kind of shower through the your screen to celebrate the fact that apparently Velma is now gay. So um, to me, I don't care. It's like if if you, um, but that, that I'll just say my opinion. That that's what I that's what I think. So that so Velma is now gay. We've talked about in prior episodes, different comic characters coming out as bisexual from Superman's son in the comics to Robin to now Wonder Woman, apparently. So uh, we definitely know Keith's opinion on some of this stuff here. But So what do you think about all this? Velma being gay, 
What do you think? So, Necessary? What do you think? Go ahead. So for 40 some years, I've been watching Scooby Doo and all its, <laughs> all its shows and, and live action heroes and everybody has fantasies about the librarian. And she woke up one day in 2022 and says, ah, I like women. <laughs> Here's my thought. Mm-hmm. You know, I have nothing against the LGBTQ community. What people do behind closed doors has no bearing on me whatsoever. I don't mm-hmm. sleep over it. But come on now. I said this when they were talking. When we talked about their, with um, Wonder Woman or with Superman. When is enough enough already? You know, whatever, what you do, who you like, whether you're black, white, purple, green, blue, whether you're male, female, trans, you like a girl, you like a boy, I don't care. But don't change something that's been going on for 40-some years just to keep up with the times. You're not keeping up with the times at this point. I'm going to leave it at that because I can go on probably with it for a lot longer, and I choose not to do so. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a family show, but uh, yeah, I'll leave it. At, I'll leave it at that. Leave well enough alone. I think I said that when you introduced the story to me in our pre-show. Um, mm-hmm. um, just leave well enough alone. Yeah, it's just it's it definitely like, it, the world continues to change around us. You know, it's like yes. as 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 kids we. Again, not, we're not against anything, no, <clears throat> like you say. Not at all. Uh, it's just interesting to have uh, fantasy characters change their sexuality over time, and you know, it, uh, for me personally, I don't care. Really, I don't. I, if it's if it's something to where I think of it as I try to put myself in a situation where if I'm a young kid, if I'm a teen, or if I'm somebody who's maybe confused or not even not even confused. I know what I I feel like I can relate to that character, and it, but it are makes you going to go feel... to a forty year old cartoon to feel? <laughs> I don't know, but I I, I mean I I don't know the old if I'm a younger person I don't know the old Scooby Doo necessarily from the sixties or where we grew up. I, all I know is the, some of the newer versions, and all I know is a popular character and a popular character is relate maybe now more relatable to me because i'm gay uh you know in that respect i'm good so if if it makes it i guess that's where i'm at if it makes a kid feel more accepted like this is okay it's fine this popular character is like me then if if that's all it does then it's worth it in my opinion versus some of the you know Maybe older generation opinions and some of that stuff here. That's just that's just how I how I take all that stuff. So I got you. Yeah, that's it. That's it. But definitely interesting. You know, like you said, either way, you know, we, you know, we definitely support the community, and you know, it's nothing against anything. It's just it's just interesting anymore. How how uh, uh, we're finding ways to show acceptance and tolerance and stuff like that. So right. Okay. All right. So now, if now I that's fine. But if Daphne comes out, is uh, I got you know that's a, yeah. I got a little problem with that because I had a little thing for Daphne growing up. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I don't know. Again, I'm gonna keep this a family G rated. Uh, let's just keep a PG rated show. Yeah, I'll have to tell you my thought I, off the air once we're finished here. <laughs> now, it, it, Keith is not here, so if we may, we know Keith. Uh, a, a thousand percent supports any type of uh, a sexuality for cartoon characters and comic books. He is a thousand percent for it. <laughs> no problems, no issues. And I think we could speak for Keith since he's not here to to speak for himself, Skinner. That's so right. That that's just it. I'm glad you did. There you go. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I, this week in pop culture history. Uh, October the 11th, back in 1975, was the very first airing of Live, It's Saturday Night. So Saturday Night Live uh, debuted 
back in 1975 already. It's so amazing that this show has run for this long. Yeah, it really is. It is certainly no arguments from anybody. Now, I'm a fan. I've mm-hmm. watched Saturday Night Live for many, many years. I still watch it today. Uh, you won't get any arguments from me that there's definitely been cast members, you know, sets of casts that are uh, leaps and bounds above others. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely, I don't agree with all of the opinions. I, you know, all there's a, you know, they know they would tell you the same thing. There's, you know, there's plenty of skits that are clunkers that you wonder how in the heck it got on live television. However, right, right. there's also been plenty of fantastic cast members and skits and characters that's been introduced on that show that's made their way into pop culture uh, fandom for many, many years. So it just made me kind of reflect on, uh, you know, too numerous to name all that you might have an interest in, but are there oh. a few characters that come to mind that uh, you might be more of a fan of or more of a, have an interest in or simply just you're more familiar with over the years. So uh, curious, any that you might have, Skinner. We maybe we can go back and forth a little bit here and uh, yeah, you know back. So well, the first one comes to, come to mind. Go ahead. Uh, mm-hmm. Just so everybody knows, I am not an avid fan like you are. Um, with that being said, there are a few characters that you get to see skits on, especially in today's day and age. Mm-hmm. Um, you can see on YouTube or on social media that 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 you didn't get to see back. Back in the day, and I just lost it. First one is Adam Sandler playing Axl Rose. Um, sure. That one, yeah. it, that one comes to mind because you know, I, obviously, Guns and Roses was one of our bands uh, growing up as a teenager that we all idolized. Uh, anybody that liked rock and roll or uh, uh, metal, they weren't mm-hmm. necessarily metal, but they were the you know the heavier side of the glam uh, glam metal, or they were the start of the glam metal. Um, but Adam Sandler did a hell of a job portraying Axl Rose in a comedic way, of course. Uh, and one other one that comes to mind is uh, Bill Murray playing Richard Dawson. Oh, that's he, right. Portraying Richard <laughs> yeah. Dawson. If anybody knows Richard Dawson, he was the um, Family Feud host that had to kiss mm-hmm. every woman on stage, whether she was 20 or she was 80. He had a mm-hmm. kiss on the lips uh, back in the what, <laughs> late seventies, early eighties, I think, yep. was when he was doing that. So those are two that come to mind right off the bat. I Bill Murray made my list in the the lounge singer. Oh, okay, he used to do that back in the back in the seventies. There, I he think I remember that it. one. Yeah, yeah, he played an over the top like like hotel type lounge singer. Right. Uh, very very good. So you know, Bill Murray had a lot of. You know, a lot of good characters. That was definitely one that came to mind. Uh, I don't have these in any particular order, but some that just, I just, that popped in my mind here, thinking about all these uh, characters of the years. Uh, Wayne and Garth, Wayne's World. So Mike Myers and Dana Carvey. Mm-hmm. Uh, great characters, a lot of fun. Just two kids, you know, having a community television show in his mom's basement became very popular. Uh, obviously made a made a movie and they made a sequel to it. So, arguably, two of the more successful characters. There's not a lot, and they've tried to make movies out of some of these characters over the years, and some mm-hmm. you definitely forget about, like the awful Coneheads movie and a few <laughs> other ones out there that really just didn't take off well in the right. theater. They did well on the the, the small screen, but the Wayne's World uh, movie, especially the first one, really took off and. Uh, also helped resurrect a queen's career, frankly, with playing right. Bohemian, Bohemian Rhapsody in the in the movie. Uh, Danny Carvey was uh, he was terrific in many roles. So I loved him as the church lady. Okay, I don't recognize yeah. that one. That's okay. So, well, isn't that special? So it was like a church lady who, you know, uh, it's, it's a very religious show. It's kind of an over the top religious show, and she would have guests on there, and she would talk to the, the guests about being sinners and all that. Like notably, she had like Madonna on there as a talk show guest and a few different ones. So, if you've never seen the Church Lady, Dana Carvey, uh, definitely go check that out. Phil Hartman was one of the funniest guys that ever was on SNL. Terrific comedian. He had a reoccurring skit 
unfrozen caveman lawyer. And you can find these are all on YouTube, I'm sure, guys. Right. Uh, any any of these unfrozen caveman lawyer was it was it was just a goofy concept to where he was a caveman, got unfrozen from ice, looked like a caveman, went on to become a lawyer, and kept using the fact that he was a caveman in his court arguments. So he would come out there and say, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just a caveman. I don't understand how all this stuff works. But what I do know is that my client is innocent. It was that type of a thing. And he kept using that argument. It, just hilarious. John Lovitz is the liar. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the ticket. That's the ticket. So he would just a, a, a a perpetual liar. He made several appearances throughout the years. I loved Will Ferrell and Sherry O'Terry as the, the super enthusiastic high school cheerleaders. They'll come out and do these cheers. Uh, they would come out and cheer for, they were like less popular cheerleaders. And they would go out and cheer for like the chess club and different things. Um, very, very funny. Uh, Keenan Thompson has been on the show forever. Uh, he has a reoccurring role. I haven't seen it lately, but uh, a DeAndre Cole is like a, a host on the BET network. What's up with that? It's the television show. He basically comes out and sings that. and dances. Yeah, he sings yep. and dances, and the people that are there too. And he gets like real guests on the skit who aren't even on the show that week, but he has some big name guests will come out there and just sit and participate in the skit. And leave, and because he's always doing all this singing and dancing, he never gets to the guest appearances, and I always run out of time. Very, very good. Um, Adam Sandler used to do a reoccurring bit, Opera Man, back in the 80s on the news. He would come out dressed like a guy, you know, singing. And he would sing. He has a pretty good singing voice, actually, Adam Sandler, but he would sing opera, different news stories in an opera, opera uh, uh, voice. Uh, t just tons and tons of it. Eddie Murphy is Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson's neighborhood was a take on Mr. Mr. Rogers. <clears throat> and uh, uh, one of my favorites of all time, the Blues Brothers, Dan Aykroyd, John oh, yeah. Belushi. Yep. They, they would come out and perform on stage and made probably, not even probably, made my most favorite movie of SNL characters, the Blues Brothers, back in 1980. Mm -hmm. Great, great stuff. So just, I could talk about this stuff for hours, but just uh, a lot of great characters over the years, a lot of funny moments. Um, still on the air this year. I mean, they, they had a lot of turnover in the in their cast uh, this past season, but they're still out there doing it. So just, uh, just pretty amazing to, to put on a live show, live comedy show that many years consecutively. Uh, a lot of work goes into that, and writing and talent is just pretty amazing stuff. So, right. that's it. That's what I got for this uh, this week in pop culture. That was the big uh, the big story, sir. Was Saturday Night Live. So, any other final thoughts? Any closing comments, no. announcements? Anything you have, sir? Nope, I don't think so. Um, just shout out to Shad uh, Shad Shoff, a uh, friend of ours from high school, turning 50 this week. That's right. Going to be at a golf outing on Saturday with him. Um, going to see Joe Satriani on Sunday down in Canton. I'm looking forward mm. to that show. I've never seen him live. Uh, anybody that knows Joe or knows music, he's uh, instrumental, uh, rock and roll. Uh, listen to him since day one. I absolutely love his music. Um, unique. Plays a hell of a guitar, to be truthful. So I'll be down on there on Sunday. Um, but no, I, that's about it. Um, got nothing else. All right, very good. Well, for me, look for me on the podcast, uh, Convincing Idiots with Dean and Nick, uh, pop culture podcast out there, also on the Boss Code Media Network, right. podcast platforms, and YouTube. So... That's what I got. Yep, couple shout outs for uh Does the Reason, uh Does Jackson Jr. uh from Bosco Media, our boss, uh producer extraordinaire and my pride and joy son Michael Skinner Jr. Thank you for all you do. Um, yes, indeed. We've talked about it before, but our kids have done a lot with our show. Uh your daughter Peyton has, you know, she developed our logos. 
Yes. And uh, our print media uh, still had some back you know, back uh, behind the scenes stuff. We need to get those three kids on the air uh, one of these times coming up. Find some time sure. to get Peyton Steele and Mike Jr. on and do, do, a, do a show just, you know, with the six of us. I think that would be a blast. Um, sure. A lot of perspective. We could probably try to do something to where we have uh, a couple weeks advance notice uh, for topics to, to talk about and everybody be prepared. I think it would be a lot of fun. Um, It'd be so, ninety-eight percent making fun of their dads, and maybe two percent right. current topics. So that's that's par for the course. That's, that's exactly that's, that's it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly it. So for Brian Fisher and Michael Skinner, we are two of the three guys from it came from Gen X. We appreciate your listening ears. We will talk to you next week. Have a great week. Go Cleveland baseball team. Keith Porter here, aka Porter House. From it came from Gen X. We hope you've been enjoying the show, but please make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.